the Son and the Holy Spirit. On this Sunday, we stand at the threshold of Great Lent. And rightfully so, the Holy Church instructs us very wisely on what is expected of us at this point in time. Namely, that we forgive others uh, whatever they may have done to us that has caused us hurt or anything like that in any respect. And that we likewise be careful that we ourselves forgive all those who may have hurt us, transgressed against us, or done anything to that effect. It would be rather illogical, I guess, to say, to spend 40 days, actually 50, in fasting and preparation for the resurrection of the Lord, when in our hearts sit demonic thoughts, hatreds, vengeance, revenge, and all sorts of things to that effect, let alone to those who might go out and physically do these things in order to hurt their neighbours. Whether their neighbours are believers or not, whether they are orthodox <coughs> or not, it doesn't matter. We are asked to forgive all men their transgressions and not to hold anything against them. And that can sometimes be a very difficult thing because people can do very terrible things to others and you probably have heard yourself when that happens and seen it saying that um, they'll be cursed by the Lord or something like that. We came across an incident that was told to us this week of a recent event that occurred in the USA in Arizona. Just wondering whether any of you have heard about it. In Arizona, there is a monastery under the guidance of an elder, Ephraim, who was originally from Mount Athos. Many of the nuns that were under the auspices of our spiritual father, Herman, have settled not far from that monastery and see Father Ephraim quite often for confession and for whatever. And of course, people from all of the USA and from places of the world try to see this elder because he has been known to be God-bearing and prophetic in many ways and helps people in their spiritual life, in their life in general. And it occurred that one lady, I think she was Greek, came to see him and started to tell him about her son who was a very successful businessman, a lawyer, and made lots of money and um, became very well known in the community and wherever was in high demand. In other words, she came to brag to the elder about her son. What happened next can only be described as shocking. The elder said to her, and one of our parishioners who will probably come later can confirm um, more exactly the words, but he said something to her that you're going to be spending the rest of your life weeping and praying because in three days your son's going to be dead because 
he has spent his life <coughs> seducing 40 or more women. And it happened. That's what occurred. For three days he died. These are the sort of gifts that people who live righteous lives receive. We wonder sometimes about this kingdom of heaven and what it is that we are striving for. And like children, we make up images to ourselves on what life there might be like. But if you were listening carefully to the uh, epistle reading before, it sort of explains it in a, a simple way for us to understand, in the sense that we were created to actually be part with God, higher than the angels, higher than any of the other creation. But without all the knowledge that was necessary to understand how to use those sorts of things. Like kids who are given certain <coughs> toys and are told you can um, use these and um, like um, I won't say have fun but um, have enjoyment with them but with one particular one you're not allowed to touch that yet because you are still too immature spiritually and if you do touch that it's going to bring death upon you of course I'm talking about Adam having never experienced death it didn't mean very much to him. What is death to a person who is born into or who is created into uh, a kingdom of heaven uh, like the dwelling place of the Lord? What is death? What does all that mean? As you know, I hope you know, from your history of theology and the history of the church that Adam was sort of inspired by Eve to touch and to use that which was forbidden, that one thing. And Eve was inspired to do that by Satan himself who saw that there was something special about this new creation which stood above the demonic realm and that brought upon them even greater envy and hatred that they wanted to destroy this particular new creation because they thought that they were the ones that, that were the favourites with the Lord. That pride, of course, caused the angelic world to separate into two groups. One which we call the demons, the <coughs> ones that cause much trouble for ourselves and for the world, and the other one, the angelic world which looks after us and to whom each and every one of us is given at their baptism and their creation. <clears throat> anyway, having touched that which they shouldn't have, the Lord called them, said Adam, where are you? Adam and Eve had hid themselves from 
recover themselves because like little children they understood that they had done something wrong but had no idea on how to escape from that situation. Holy Fathers said that the escape would have been repentance, confessing that yes we did this and um, we repent of that and we're um, highly um, affected by it and we beg the Lord to return us to the state in which we were created. But once again, being spiritually immature, instead of doing that, they started to blame one another, even to the effect where Adam blamed God, blamed Christ, saying that um, it was that woman that you gave me that made me do this. Our, go our good and man-loving God did not destroy them but prepared a providential way of saving mankind on account of the fact that in a sense they were tricked to do this being immature spiritually, without understanding fully, they were tricked and therefore it would be unfair to uh, destroy such a creation. The rest you know, and over the next six or seven weeks, you will hear the various ways that have been given to us in order that we truly may repent of our unrighteous ways and on Pascha meet the risen Lord in the way that we were supposed to be with Him. How much of that we experience will depend a lot upon the work that we do with ourselves. And I know that in the world that we live today, it's very difficult, and I keep saying that to you every week, difficult because we have no examples, difficult because we don't have guides, and the guides that we do have, for some reason, seem to be dissatisfied, which with that which has filled up the kingdom of heaven like these um, changes that are being introduced all over the place um, new forms of so-called liturgy which have no golden chain tradition behind them one in particular that's very popular is this um, West and right business. Where did that come from? Perhaps at one stage there was some sort of liturgy or something to that effect, but it had no cont continuity and therefore it has a breakage and it doesn't have the fulfillment of the cycle of services that the church gives to us through the other sort of services, liturgies and whatever that we have. And as they say, if it ain't broke, why fix it? Why? What, what are you going to gain by changing something that's been proven for thousands of years to be a sure way into the kingdom of heaven, a 
as long as you are prepared to live that sort of life. Why would you want to change it? Countries have already changed the Bible. Have left out vital parts, key parts. Have turned it into a storybook and not a book of salvation. A storybook so that when someone reads it, they think, well, big deal. You know, what's there? What's in it for me? What's it? How is this going to help me? And on it goes, and it's getting worse and worse and worse. Next week we will be, God willing, celebrating the restoration of orthodoxy. Um, which has much to do with icons, which I will talk to you about next week. But all those sorts of things that we have in the church, which have been given to us, not in vain, but for specific purposes, because the fall that we inherited from our forefathers, from Adam and Eve, is so great that it requires work which a person by themselves cannot do. That's why Christ came to earth and that's why he actually did the work for us and as, as it were, as our spiritual father used to say, when he was lifted up on that cross, he, he grabbed the rest of mankind that wanted to be with him and um, brought him back to the kingdom of heaven because we were not given that sort of power to uh, free ourselves from that fallen state. And that fallen state is what causes us the pain in our lives, which no one escapes. Rich or poor, sick or healthy, no matter where you live, whatever you do, no one escapes that because of the nature of what happened to our makeup when that fall occurred. Those who are wise and who look into this and consider why this is so and pray about it will find orthodoxy. And we know many that do and have come from backgrounds which you could describe as only being viral and overnight have virtually changed themselves to become confessors of the true faith and examples to others also to come and join the true church, which exists not, as they say, in buildings, in temples, but in the hearts of men and women. And that is where the concentration of your own salvation rests. This week on first week of um, Great Lent, we have that prayer, it's an air from the Syrian, um, O Lord, Master of my life, give me not a spirit of idleness, despondency, ambition or vain talk, but rather a spirit of purity, humility, patience, and love bestow upon me, O Lord. Yeah, Lord, and King, grant me to see my own 
fault, she won't be judged my brother. She lifts her down to the ages of ages. Amen. Nothing very impossible in that. But a cry and a prayer to the Lord to put us into a position where the sinful lives that we live and we all live sinful lives will be forgiven, will be wiped out and that we will be able to share the kingdom of heaven for eternity. How? We don't know. All we know is that it is such an incredible thing that those who have been given the opportunity to glimpse it a little bit cannot in words even try to explain any of it. On this account, on this day, in the larger parishes and in monasteries, there is a service in the evening where people beg forgiveness of each other, um, including the priest. What I will do is do that now to you, and then after the service, you can do it all amongst yourself. So, for whatever reason I may have in any way offended you, hurt you or did something to you that was not according to your likeness forgive me and pray that I may change my life so as to be an example for all those whom we come across to follow Christ in truth Okay, so after the liturgy, um, please beg forgiveness of each other and um, strive to hold that prayer of St. Ephraim the Syrian in your heart every day. Memorize it. I think you all know it by now. And keep it in your heart. Because that is the prayer of great grief. God help us, preserve us, and protect us. Let us say.